uh, valuable time. There you go. Okay. Well, welcome all. Thank you very much for joining us. My name, in case you don't know it, is Peter Havens, and I have the pleasure of being the chair of Baldwin Management and Baldwin Investment Management. And welcome to what we hope will be the first of many quarterly Zoom calls where we're going to give you some of our current thoughts, but really most of the time is meant for you to ask questions. Anything that is bothering you or you're just curious about or whatever it is that you like to ask, but let's keep it with all, all within the realm of investments and that sort of stuff. Uh, today, uh, joining me um, as a co-host of this is uh, Richard, uh, Richard May, who is a managing director at RKM. And so uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to another associate uh, of ours, Christina McCloy, who is going to give us some of the rules of the road as far as the mechanics of the Zoom call. So Chrissy? Hi, everybody. I'm Christina. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here real quickly with you. Um, <laughs> So we can just go over um, a few details um, while we are in here. Um, the Zoom conference, uh, while the presentation is happening, we're gonna ask everyone to keep themselves on mute as to deter any distracting background noise um, that could distract the audience from hearing what's being uh, presented. Uh, we will have a Q&A session afterwards. During that session, we ask that everyone continue to stay muted um, and use the raise your hand feature. Uh, that'll add you to a queue, and then I'll call your name as as your names come into the queue. When you are called out for your question, just unmute yourself, ask your question, um, and then when you're done discussing your question, just make sure you put yourself back on mute. Um, how to raise your hand if you are connected via your computer. Um, if you hover over the bottom of your screen here, a menu will pop open. Um, you click this reactions button and there is a raise hand feature. That's how that will get you into the queue. And then you do the exact same thing to lower your hand. You just click that reactions button and hit lower your hand. If you are joined via phone, you can dial star nine on your phone and that will add you to the queue as well. Um, uh, I will unmute you, instruct you to ask your questions, and then once finished, you can dial star nine again, and that will take you out of the queue. And that is the uh, instruction on how to do all of that. Uh, we're gonna start the discussion, and then at the end, I'll just go over that one more time, and then we'll get into the Q&A. Um, so I'm gonna pass back to Peter, and we're ready to go. Okay. So uh, we will plan on taking our topics that we're going to present to you, some of our current thoughts out of our quarterly commentary, which you can find on our website. And the, the, the topic that we're going to go over in some detail today is inflation. And this has been a worry for most pundits and most investors for at least the last couple of years. And it's been the issue that has had the greatest influence on where the markets have gone. So if we can go to the next slide, Chrissy, please. Mm -hmm. So here are a series of charts. And you see in the top left-hand corner, graphs over time, both the headline CPI and core CPI. Now, the difference between those two measures, if you will, is the headline CPI includes food and energy, and the core drops those two very volatile sub-indices out. So you get sort of, the Fed seems to think that you get a better look at what inflation is really doing if you strip out very volatile series like food and energy. But you can clearly see here how the headline CPI has clearly rolled over. And also it looks like the core CPI has rolled over. 
And we would contend, as we have in our writings now for over a year, that the forward indicators of inflation, not the CPI in particular, but other forward indicators that we'll uh, show you, have clearly demonstrated that the that inflation has indeed rolled over and will become a non-issue uh, going forward. And so we're now beginning to see the lagging indicators, i.e. the CPI, the PPI, the producer price index, the PCE, the personal consumption expenditure index, which is an index that the Fed likes to use a lot. They've all rolled over and it clearly looks as though indeed inflation is, is becoming a non-issue. If you go to the top right-hand um, uh, graph, you see headline CPI components. And here you can see energy at the top. You can see, again, another example of how energy is rolled over. In fact, oil prices today are less than they were last year at this time. You might remember as the Ukraine war started, the price of oil skyrocketed to $120 a barrel. It's now less than $80 a barrel. Uh, you'll also see their food prices. They have rolled over. And you'll see core goods prices, and they have rolled over. And a lot of that is because supply lines, logistics have gotten themselves straightened out another time. Remember a good bit of the inflation that got put into our system was because of what happened during COVID and logistics lines uh, got thrown out of whack. And it takes time to get these things going again so that they're running smoothly and there's no sand in the gears. Unfortunately, a lot of people are pretty impatient. A lot of investors are pretty impatient and they expect to turn around an economy as big as the United States in two weeks, and that doesn't happen. But now we're clearly seeing signs that logistics problems have melted away. And in fact, that part of the inflation equation seems to be um, uh, in the past. But you'll see here core services, looks like it's a little bit sticky. It looks like it's holding up. Now this is, you know, think of going out to a restaurant, uh, talking to your accountant, or talking to your lawyer, uh, the prices there have seemed to be a little bit stickier, i.e. they've gone up and it doesn't look like they've rolled over, except if you look down in the bottom right corner, you're starting to see a sign that even core CPI services has rolled over. Now, if you go to the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see one of the biggest factors within the calculation of the CPI, and that is owner's equivalent rent. Now, this is a contrived number. So the, uh, economists get together and they developed a formula. And this is, let me step back, shelter represents about 30% of the calculation of the consumer price index. Now, part of that is represented by rents and apartments. That's about 9% of the 30%. But about 21% of the 30% is so-called owner's equivalent rent. And just imagine, if you will, you had decided to rent your house or what you could rent your house for. So it's very much a contrived number. They don't do a survey going around the countryside and say, well, what, you know, what are houses renting for in San Antonio? And what are they renting for in, in Duluth? And what are they renting for in San Jose? They just, they make up this number through a calculation. And you'll see that in the sort of the, the line that's still sort of going up, but looks like they say signs of peaking. Well, if you look at a couple of other lines on that graph, the Zillow Observed Rent Index and the Apartment List Rent Index, rent index these are actual surveys done. These are actual apartments that are getting rented in the marketplace. And you can see those, those curves have already rolled over and are down considerably. And so that's going to lead that third line to roll over and start descending. 
And that's going to have a big influence in the near future on the calculation of CPI, because this is going to be a big weight that's just going to go down. It's not going to go up. It's just going to go down. And when it goes down, it's going to take down 30% weight of the CPI, which is going to be a big influence. Okay, Chrissy, next slide, please. So here we're taking a look at average private sector hourly earnings. Now this is a big component of the so-called services index inflation number. Again, think of services. What's the, what's the primary factor within services in calculating inflation? It's wages. Services are basically, you're putting people to work and they're doing things. And so the biggest cost in the services index is wages. And so here again, you can see how coming out of the pandemic, where you saw this great dive in numbers, uh, it rocketed up and now it has clearly rolled over. And we're seeing this more and more as the labor markets have become less rigid, they have become less frozen. Uh, people are not leaving their jobs as much. Uh, their unemployment, if you will, the, 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 the number of people who are seeking unemployment benefits is ticking up a little bit. And the, the job growth rate is not as strong as it was. So the labor market is becoming more unfrozen, a little bit more liquid, more fluid. And that means employers are getting a little bit of the upper hand here. And they're sitting there saying, well, you know, uh, it used to be a few months ago that if a, an employee threatened to quit, oh, my God, you know, where am I going to find a replacement? Now, oh, okay, you're going to quit, you're going to quit. I'll, you know, I'll go out to the marketplace and I'll find a replacement. I'm not saying it's across the board. I'm not saying there aren't still some, some you know, like nursing, still very difficult. To get nurses and nurses are commanding much more money than they used to command. But the labor market is unfreezing a bit, which means that that, um, that curve that you're looking at is going to continue to move down. Next slide, please, Chrissy. So this takes a look at so-called real interest rates. So Real interest rates are interest rates where inflation is stripped out. And this is something that the Fed's been very concerned about, that real interest rates uh, still, according to their calculation, uh, generated a negative number, i.e. that uh, monetary policy was still way too relaxed and it need to get tightened up to slow down the economy. We contend, however, that uh, the Fed and a lot of economists are, are miscalculating this, and that in fact, real interest rates are really quite high. And so what do we mean by this? The way the calculation works is that they will take uh, the, uh, interest rate that's out there in the marketplace, say the one-year treasury, and they'll subtract an inflation number. And typically the inflation number that they use is either the CPI or the PPI, the producer price index. But both of those measures are backward looking. They're telling you what inflation has been, not what inflation is going to be. Whereas the interest rate that they're using is a forward-looking number, i.e. what is the price of money going to be on a one-year treasury? So we think the better way of measuring the real interest rate, what is the, what is the real rate of interest right now, is to take the one-year treasury, if you will, but to go into the markets, either into the bond market or various economic surveys, and where they, where, where either the bond market, they'll clearly, you can clearly see what investors are expecting inflation to be in a year's period of time. Or you can do surveys 
where they ask consumers, well, what do you think inflation is going to be in a year's time or three years time or something like that? And use those forward looking numbers to make a correct calculation. So you're using a forward looking interest rate to be your um, to be one of the numbers. And then you're looking your at the forward looking uh, inflation calculation is determined by the bond market. And what you see is what you see in the far right hand side of this chart that in fact, real interest rates today are a positive 2%, not a negative number that the Fed keeps worrying about. And at a positive 2%, if you look to the left, you'll see these shaded areas on the graph, it's a light blue those demark recessions. So if you see the real interest rate approaching 3%, as you see in the, in back around 2000 and then 2006, that's getting into an area where it would be predictive of a recession. So we think that this is another bit of information that the Fed hopefully is using to begin to back off their increases in interest rates. In other words, we think that they have pretty much done the job that they wanted to do, which was increase interest rates, begin to restrict monetary policy and slow down the economy. And at a real interest rate of 3%, historically what has happened is you've promoted a recession and that will certainly slow the economy. So with that, I'm going to turn it on over to Richard. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Chrissy, leave that slide there for a minute. I have a couple of comments that the, this previous slide. I have a couple of comments on that. Um, the the uh, everything Peter says is is somewhat hopeful that we're that we're turning the corner on inflation. That interest rates are now getting to the to the level that the Fed can actually begin to pause. Um, the 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 issues that I bring to the table are some potential black swans that are still out there, but then a hopeful uh, a discovery of a golden goose in, uh, in some, some positive readings with some of my charts. Um, noting this particular chart, the uh, perceived inflation that's used to create this, this graph um, is about to, the inflation reading is about to start dropping fairly precipitously because the year over year inflation is now comparing to rates in 2022 that were actually beginning to get worrisome. I think it was June of 2022, there was 9% inflation. Uh, it, it, it surged from five or six up to nine. So as we start to look at inflation year over year, um, the numbers are gonna get, gonna get smaller because the comparisons are more favorable and this might uh, vault this, uh, this particular chart up to 3% before we even know it, before the Fed can even react. So there is a danger of what Fed policy, and Peter's mentioned this, Fed policy in trying to tame inflation may just throw, it, throw us right into the next recession. It's not lost on the fact that the last time we were at 3% was right before 2008. And before that, it was right before 2001. So these are not particularly good favorable comparisons. Um, there, there are four major black swans that I'm worried about. Uh, one, Peter's mentioned in the labor shortages, but as, uh, as we see, the numbers are improving. The unemployment that was just announced was uh, uh, a little bit unfavorable for those people that are now unemployed, but actually more favorable to people that hope that we're getting a little bit of uh, addressing that labor shortage which may eventually alleviate some of the wage inflation that we've seen. Um, another, another worrisome uh, point in the universe is the fact that the war in Europe is still going on. There doesn't seem to be any progress despite the recent Chinese proposal for a ceasefire. Uh, and that's had a negative effect on both food supplies and energy costs. Uh, and that's been compounded by Russia's recent agreement with Saudi Arabia to constrain the supply of oil and natural gas. So we're going to see some energy costs surging. We've already seen it at the pump a little bit. 
that may be another negative that we have to overcome. There's a new model of Keynesianism that's called appropriately new Keynesianism. And one of its adherents is Olivier, Olivier uh, Blanchard at MIT. And uh, he says inflation, the, the, the new Keynesianism says that uh, inflation is stickier than we thought it was before. So we may see a little bit of sticky inflation, especially in some of those core. core uh, and that might influence Fed policy uh, to continue to raise rates in, in face of this increasing chance of uh, sending us into recession. And the last piece before I get to the next chart, which is a hopeful chart, is that uh, the Fed was determined to keep raising interest rates until something broke. Uh, well, <laughs> something just broke. The banking industry had some uh, difficulties with not only uh, a Silicon Valley Bank, but also Signature Bank and Credit Suisse over in Europe had some problems, although different problems than some of the American banks. Uh, however, there's something that's put out frequently, I think it's quarterly, called the Beige Book. Is that right, quarterly, Peter? Yeah. No? Uh, the Beige Book actually says the effects of the banking crisis so far have been pretty moderate, and there hasn't been any wholesale bank runs or any kind of uh, worrisome activity in, in, in some of the mid-sized banks. Uh, and the, the last thing I mentioned is uh, we're getting readings of a prospective recession, but we're still seeing a relatively positive stock market. So the contradiction there is a little uh, disconcerting, uh, whether whichever side is right, we'll find out pretty soon. But uh, Chrissy, can you take us to the next slide, which is I, I think much more hopeful uh, view of the of the universe. This is uh, the University of Michigan, a place near and dear to my heart. Uh, going back to 1971, showing uh, the consumer confidence index over time, and I note that every time we enter a recession, it has a negative effect on consumer confidence, which is you know, certainly intuitive. What it does also show is that once the trough of consumer confidence is reached, uh, the confidence level starts surging upwards pretty rapidly. So there's a recovery in confidence and a recovery in conf confidence would obviously be helpful to the economy. We're at just a, a similar trough as we were in 2008, 2009. Actually, it's even a little bit lower. The lowest reading here was even a little bit lower in 2008. Uh, and even though that means the consumer does not have a lot of confidence, the good news is there's only one way for this to go, and it's up. And I would fully expect us to see the same sort of pattern recovering from this trough of consumer confidence that we saw back in 74, 80, 2000, or 91, 2000, 2008, 2009. And uh, th this would be hopeful to indicate that Maybe if there is a recession, it will be a short and shallow one. Uh, to the next slide, Chrissy, please. This is uh, a slide from uh, JP Morgan's most recent quarterly um, investment report. It's a, it's a report we go over with a fine tooth comb. Um, here at RKM, we've been uh, propo uh, proponents of including alternatives in portfolios for several years. And uh, the, this is a portfolio diversification statistics from the last 40, let's see, no, 33 years of statistics of, of portfolios that in, do not include alternatives and do include alternatives. And uh, the, the Y axis here, which is the, the horizontal axis, is annual returns and the vertical axis is volatility, which is a surrogate for risk. Anytime you move up the y-axis or back toward zero on the x-axis, you're either getting a higher return or decreased risk. And in each of these cases, interestingly enough, even from a 80-20 equity bond portfolio, putting 30% in alternatives uh, gives you a significantly lower level of risk and a marginally better return. A 60-40 portfolio, and again, this is statistics, 89 to third quarter 22, 
uh, a 60-40 portfolio having 30% alternatives gives you a slightly higher return and slightly less risk. And the, the one all the way to the left, which is a 40-60 portfolio, the inclusion of 30% in, in alternatives there uh, gives you actually significantly better return and actually less risk as well. So there is a way to invest even in an economy that has some sticky inflation. Uh, and we would, we would argue and continue to argue that the inclusion of alternatives is a good strategy, not only for enhancing returns, but also uh, uh, mitigating the risk. And the last slide, please, Chrissy. This is one of our favorites at RKM. It shows the, the black bar chart is the return in each year from 1980 on. And obviously the good news is most of the returns are positive. 32 out of 43 years, the return was positive. Uh, 2000 to 2002 was the only period we had uh, uh, three successive years of declines. And that of course was marked by 9-11, which amplified what at the, in 2001 was actually a recovering economy. But the good news here is every single year has had a negative number attached to it. And that negative number is what the drop of the markets during the year, the inter, inter year decline, uh, that basically doesn't guarantee any kind of a negative return. Uh, even the lowest part on that chart, which was a minus 49%, ended up with the market actually slightly ahead. Um, and recently, the, uh, the, the chart for last year, uh, the, the market was down 19%, but at one point, the market was down 25. Even in 2023, we've already had a 4% decline and we're up here with seven, it's now up a little bit over 8%. So this is just part of the deal. Uh, investing in equities involves risk, but it also involves the pretty constant uh, level of returns across time. Uh, that's all I have at this point. I have another uh, point to bring up a little bit later. Okay, well, thank you, Richard. So time for Q and A. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? And it doesn't have to be about this material. It could be anything that's uh, concerning you, worrying you keeping you up at night. And I'm just going to remind people um, how to raise your hand uh, at the bottom of the screen. If you use the reactions button, there's a raise your hand option. If you're joined by the computer, if you're joined over the phone, just hit star nine and that'll put you in the queue. While we're waiting, I have a question for Peter. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked uh, often about the exorbitant privilege that the US enjoys from having its currency as the reserve currency. There's been a lot of sort of loose chatter in the last year about the de-dollarization going on right now in the world. Is this, is this something you're worried about? Uh, no, uh, not for the foreseeable future. Uh, there has been because of because of competition with China, because of what's been going on in Russia, uh, and 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 because of what the U.S. has done with regard to sanctions, there are a number of countries, and especially China and Russia, who have wondered about well, let's we don't want to be beholden to the U.S. dollar. When we say that the U.S. dollar is a reserve currency of the world, what we mean is that essentially most of economic life in the world gets transacted through the U.S. dollar. You don't basically do business between the renminbi in China and the real in, in Brazil. Even though they're big trading partners, what happens is when a deal gets done, and when so when goods are delivered, uh, the the real will get exchanged for dollars, which will then get exchanged for renminbi, and then it works in the opposite direction. 
So at current trade flows, the US dollar represents about, last I saw, about 65% of the world trade flows. The next largest currency block is the Euro and the Euro is somewhere around 17, 18%. Then you go to the Japanese yen. And then finally, you're gonna get down to something like the renminbi, Chinese renminbi. The, the Russian ruble doesn't, with regard to most trade doesn't exist. Nobody, nobody will use that as a currency of exchange. So, uh, I, I'm not concerned about uh, the dollar in the immediate future because there is no alternative. Tina, there is no alternative. Uh, people will have to continue to use the dollar because we have the biggest, most liquid markets in the world and also markets which counterparties trust. And that's a great deal of what goes behind a reserve currency. It's got to be liquid. It's got to be deep. In other words, there, there is plenty of supply and demand for it. And people have got to trust that the deal will get completed. So for the immediate future, no. Uh, we've got too much of a lead. Uh, but it is something about which we do need to be concerned for the future because if we're not concerned about it, if we, if we continue to run budget deficits as we have, if we continue to have huge debts outstanding, people will seek alternatives and eventually they'll be successful. Eventually another one will arrive. I mean, just think about history. Um, the pound sterling was the world's reserve currency through certainly the 19th century, the 20th uh, century, into the early part of the 20th century, and then it wasn't because coming out of World War I, the U.S. dollar became, because we became the economic power in the world and also the military power in the world, the U.S. dollar became the world's reserve currency. And that has allowed us to behave badly. That has allowed us to um, run deficits which are too big and have too much debt on our balance sheet. And we don't worry about it because again, there's no alternative out there. People will always buy the dollar. They will always use the treasury markets. And that's because there is no competition. But one day there may well be competition. But right now I'm not concerned about it. Another option to ask questions, just in case anybody doesn't want to speak out, you can enter a question into the chat and um, I will read the question aloud for you. Um, we do have a question. Barry Cutler, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. The one or two words I haven't heard so far are debt ceiling. And I see a lot of it on the news even today. And I wonder, is Wall Street just assuming that it's uh, too much to imagine and that they're going to work something out? Or is there real fear that this could have some of the consequences that they're talking about? You want me to take that, Richard? Oh, thanks, Peter. <laughs> I, a client asked us that this morning, and uh, we quoted you as saying, Peter's not worried about it. Um, it's, it's like the, we've seen this movie before, and uh, this is just the most recent iteration. We might, we might have a technical default. The, uh, that would mean that it, if some bills might not be paid. Uh, there might be a suspension of uh, certain services. They could close down the government as they did back in the, the Clinton face-off. Um, but at the end of the day, I like to think that some, uh, some reasonableness in both the Senate, the House, and the administration reached some sort of compromise. Uh, it disturbs me a little bit that the Biden administration is not willing to sit down to talk about it. 
but I guess that's their negotiating strategy. Yeah, I would um, uh, concur with Richard that at the end of the day, it will get solved. Uh, there may be fireworks before we get to uh, that day. And there's going to be a, a lot of wringing of hands on the television and people worried about Armageddon. But there are enough uh, people in the, the sort of the, the, the centrist part of both parties that they'll be able to get cobbled together some sort of a deal and, and get the debt ceiling raised. Now, what could be the possible reaction in the market? If you go to, uh, I don't know if you all can see this, but this, this chart that was just put up. Christine, can you put that one up again? Yeah, I'll just have to share. All right, so if you look at 2011, that's the last time we had one of these serious fights. And that's when we, when the S uh, when S and P downgraded uh, U.S. debt from AAA to a double A plus. They're the only service that did it, but they did it. Um, you'll see there, even in that year, the market ended up being just flat. It was up. It was zero. But at one point during the year, it was down 19 percent when everybody thought the wheels were coming off the wagon. But we must always remember that the market is forward looking. So the market, I, I dare say, will presume that we're going to get through this. Again, between now and that realization, the market could well sell off because they're going to be worried. It's going to be raining of hands. But um, I, th I think most people um, who are in Washington and who are on Wall Street believe that eventually cooler heads will prevail and a deal will get done. But that's not to say that there won't be some fireworks in between time. We're, we're looking at it as an opportunity uh, to add add to positions if there is indeed a a uh, government st sh slow down or stoppage. Um, Jane, you're next. Go ahead and un unmute yourself. We can't hear you, Jane. There we go. Well, I, I couldn't find how to do it. Oh. I think <laughs> help me. Um, I think we will have, I think the, 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 um, the budget will, will go probably be decided at midnight before it will happen. But I think you're right. It will be a, a real mess. I live in Washington, so we're very much aware of when people you know don't know whether they go to work on Monday or not. Um, but the question, um, who actually, how do, we, how do we get the money? Do we put bonds out and people take it? How do we get the money, actually get the money to come in? I mean, how do we, when we, when we need to borrow more money, how do we do it? Oh, sure. So it's very easy. The government just auctions treasury debt. Okay. And they're just big, big auctions periodically through a year when uh, the government decides it needs some more money and it's got room in its debt cap to, to go ahead and issue debt. So that's okay. all that happens. And who buys it? Is it, I thought China used to buy a lot. Is it just the whole world will buy it? Different well, people? The whole world, whole world buys it, but it gets down to retail investors here in the United States. Some of the biggest retail investors of US treasury debt are Japanese housewives. Really? They own huge chunks of U.S. Treasury debt. But so it's, it's 
it's Japanese housewives, it's American retail investors, it's American institutional investors, it's European institutional investors. Uh, probably the biggest holder of U.S. debt now um, might well, well, it's either going to be the Japanese or maybe the Chinese. No, I think the Chinese have sold some of those down. But it's it's a it's a broad array of holders. Okay, thank you. And and the reason for that is because investors around the world trust that the United States will always pay its debts. And it always has. And I dare say it always will. You know, we may go through these hysterical moments where people are yelling and screaming at one another and saying, well, I'm not going to do that and you're not going to do this. But eventually it all happens. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't currently have anybody else in the queue. Um, we'll give it a couple moments here in case anybody has any other questions. This is just a, a, a piece of trivia. Let me offer out to our, our guests. 150 years ago when the, the British were the powerhouses around the world, the most popular investment in England at the time was owning uh, either stock or bonds in American railroads. And uh, a lot of wealth in the British Empire of personal wealth was tied up in US rail. Interesting, interesting, just piece of trivia. Thank you. Well, following on that, Richard, um, we we wrote about in, in the most recent commentary, which you can find on our website, uh, about an international investment uh, at, in a company called Novo Nordisk. And what, what this company discovered, and it was by pure serendipity, Novo, you all may know, is a, is a drug company, and they're one of the biggest in the insulin market for diabetics. And that, that in itself is a, um, is a huge market, which is still growing because we have an epidemic in the world uh, with regard to diabetes. But Novo in their labs in coming up with uh, their, their latest and greatest uh, drug to uh, combat diabetes uh, came up with some uh, protein agonists called uh, GLP-1s, which are uh, which is a form of drug which makes the um, the taker, if you will, the patient feel fuller. So it, it regulates uh, a person's sugars um, uh, very well. But the, a, a side benefit was that people ended up losing weight because they felt fuller. Now that wasn't what anybody at Novo was going after, but that's what occurred. And so now they started selling uh, their versions of this in the marketplace, and you may know it as Ozempic, you may have seen ads for Ozempic, or Wagovi, uh, as weight loss treatments. And so here we have an instance where if you're an international investor, as, as British investors came to the United States to invest in rails and made fortunes doing that, because here you had a a growing country, a growing economy, um, you know, you, you can go overseas and find some very interesting companies that are doing some fascinating work and, and uh, often be the case, they do it better than an American company or they're doing it before an American company. 
And now Eli Lilly has gotten into this marketplace and they've got something called Munjara, which is their competitor to Wagovi. And, but it's addressing exactly the same marketplace, but they're the second mover in it. So just a little pitch, if you will, for international investing. All right, we have a question from Charlie. Charlie, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, this uh, session. It's been very informative. Um, talked about consumer confidence turning the corner or turning a bend. Um, what sector should we pay attention to as that happens? Is there something that reacts quicker or more uh, in uh, in relationship to the consumer confidence that would react faster than another? This is for Richard or Peter. Yeah, well, let, let me take a first stab at that, Peter, while you're composing the right answer. Um, my first reaction would be leisure and hospitality industry, because that everybody's been cooped up for so long. Um, there's still people coming out of their, you know, cellars, so to speak, taking their masks off and actually joining the human uh, population again. And uh, as that confidence grows, I think we have more people traveling, more people staying in hotels, more people eating in restaurants, and more people buying discretionary items. So it's already a pretty robust economy there, but I think you're going to see see more so. The, the people have stopped buying things. They came out of the out of the pandemic buying things. Now they're buying experiences. Okay, so it sounds like more like a discretionary type of uh, uh, spending, and and now we just got to figure out where 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 people <laughs> are discreetly holding holding yeah. back. Maybe, maybe Charlie, maybe bowling alleys, maybe it's time <laughs> to, buy, to buy a bowling alley. <laughs> uh, can I uh, pop another question here? The, sure. The, Richard, you talked about sticky inflation and, and the current thinking uh, with MIT. I, I don't know that I particularly understand what the st sticky inflation is. I can kind of make it up in my mind what I think it is, but could, could you give me give a little more elaboration on that? Yeah, let me talk a little bit about the way I learned Keynesian economics is it's supply and demand. It's just purely mathematical. And if you have certain things happen, the prices just automatically come right. back to, to an equilibrium pricing. And I think what they found out is equilibrium, equilibrium is not quite as uh, mathematical as they thought. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So there's a bit of a lag maybe between the reaction time of that. Okay, good, thank you very much. And, and I would add to that, um, about two years ago, so, well, maybe a little bit more than that, maybe three years, pre-COVID, if you will, um, central bankers around the world were extremely concerned about disinflation. We'd spent 10 years trying to get some inflation, and we couldn't do it. Central bankers around the world know how to defeat inflation, but defeating disinflation or deflation even worse. So now we're thinking about the Great Depression. So how do you combat that? That was really very scary. And that's what drove interest rates down to essentially zero because, and, and monetary policy was so free and loose because central bankers were scared to death of deflation and didn't want to have a, a, a you know a, a depression. So now we got inflation. You know we we, we hit the the, the pandemic. Uh, the Fed flooded the markets with flooded the economies uh, with all sorts of cash and put cash into people's direct pockets, if you will. So didn't go through intermediaries. I mean, checks were written out directly to people. And now we've got this inflation. And so that's what uh, it, it has turned the table on its head, if you will. And now we're now all of a sudden people got concerned about inflation another time. 
So, but they knew how to combat that. They jacked up interest rates, made money much more expensive than it was. And they did it in a very short period of time. This was one of the fastest increases in interest rates that we've seen out of the Fed in the Fed's history. In a period of a few months, we went from zero to what is now about four and three quarters percent on the Fed funds rate. That's a very, very substantial and steep climb in interest rates. So all of a sudden, that sort of jolted the market, and now people are pulling back because money's gotten expensive. So it's just curious how we see we we spent 10 years being scared to death of deflation, of possibly a, a depression, and fighting that with low interest rates and, and very loose monetary policy. And then we turned it right around after, after COVID and after the system was flooded with cash. Right. I don't have any other questions in the queue at the moment. Um, I'm just gonna take a second to remind everybody that this is being recorded. We will post the video of the conversation to the Baldwin management website. Um, you can go to baldwinmgt.com slash events. And this event is listed. Um, we should have the video up by Monday. So if you want to send it to anybody, or if you want to just go back and listen again, or getting in for your information, you can do that by Monday. And um, obviously, all of us are available, Peter, Richard, um, are available for questions. If you have anything after the fact, you can feel free to call or send an email at any time. Okay, well, uh, any other questions, Chrissy? Nope. Uh, we okay. are so uh, we're planning on doing this next quarter and we're planning on doing this every quarter. So uh, we will uh, bring up another topic and we look forward to conversation, questions, worries, whatever it is. And if in between times you have any of those questions or, uh, or worries, feel free to call any of us here. So thank you all very much for your time and your attendance. Thank you very much for coming.